have already probably been at that webpage. Um, but that's where you'll find your resources. We are recording this only for internal use. It will end up on a password protected Vimeo site for about, I don't know, probably between now and when we start up again. So that those of you who, that this messed up your schedule and you can't see the rest of it, um, or other people that, that had problems getting into us today, um, it will be available to you for a month. Um, let's see, what else do we wanna tell you before we get started? Uh, if you looked at that page for like managing your Zoom experience, this is based on a lot of experience. We were training by Zoom before the pandemic. So we've been thinking about this for a while. As you can, we strongly, strongly encourage you to leave your video on. In fact, if I look over here, I'm looking at all of you. Um, and it's, this allows us to kind of see how things are landing. You know, if you get the jokes, um, if your eyebrows are down because something didn't, didn't work. And so that's super helpful for us to be able to see you. Um, we do recommend, however, that you turn off self view and I'll show you how to do that. That's the best thing to relieve Zoom fatigue. Uh, we're gonna get spotlighted, we are spotlighted. So if you can do view side by side, you'll see both me and Amanda and the, um, and the PowerPoints. And as you can tell, I talk with my hands a lot. I've, I've, if you've seen me in person, I'm usually all over the room with big gestures. I've learned to keep them in the Zoom box. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'll say things like, you know, you took an, a, an idea from conception through execution to presentation. Like you, you thought about it, you did it, you put it out in the world in a paper. And so most of my hand gestures have meanings, right? So that's part of why we do that. It's, it's yet another, another channel that Amanda and I have for communication with you, right? Um, thank you, all of you for having names that we can call you. It's always really sad when somebody has like J256 and then they ask a question and we don't know what to say. <laughs> like, well, J256. Uh, we monitor the chat a lot. We encourage you to use it. Uh, we also recommend, you know, just raise your hand, like use the hand raise, or you can even unmute and interrupt us. We like interruptions. We really do. All right. So if you don't know where these things are, um, this is, if you mouse over your own face, three little dots will appear and that will bring you this menu. And that allows you to hide your self view pretty easily. Um, this is, boy, learning that early on has um, saved my sanity <laughs> through all of this. All right, are we ready to go? Thank you all of you who have turned your cameras on. Um, we understand it's not always possible. And we would also like to remind you that those of you working, if you're working from home, we welcome your two and four footed coworkers. Yes. The only thing that we ask is that if we see the little cat tail go across the screen or a dog pops up, that you introduce them in the chat so we know their needs. Same with the kids. <laughs> Same with the kids, yes. All right. So we're gonna start with a poll everywhere. We'll use this a couple of times throughout our four sessions, more than a couple, I think. Um, you can also drop this in the chat if you like, but Marissa's dropping the link in the chat. You, you can skip the, enter your name. You don't have to do that. But if you put it in the chat, Amanda and I will put it, actually, Amanda, we have to decide one person's doing it. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> but we wanna know what field you're in. Great, biomedical engineering. We've got a math that's oh i've worked on a couple of really cool math mm -hmm. careers yeah more engineering so we have mechanical biology public health social work um oncology oh cool that's interesting so um we should probably have some discussions about that right because mm -hmm. getting an nsf career it really can't smell like nih would fund it so we can definitely talk about how you would do really basic science um, that would potentially be relevant for a career proposal. We've got nursing, hooray, seeing um, physics, worked on some very cool, um, oh, it was materials physics where they were, it was a superconducting one that was so cool. That was the last one I worked on. Yeah. Great, radiation oncology. Nice, neuroscience, yay, <laughs> my people. Um, management. Mm -hmm. So there could be something in um, social behavioral sciences or other parts of NSF that could be useful for you. Great. 
All right. So as as Aaron said, what we're going to be doing is helping you all think through everything you need to really consider before you begin to write. Right. Oh, we've got a few more coming in. Lots of you in various parts of engineering. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So why do Amanda and I think we can talk to you across all of these disciplines? We think about grant proposals. We think about grant proposals a lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> we think about like careers and the purpose of careers. So let's kind of walk you through the things that I think you kind of need to know about careers. Um, this is a quote from the solicitation. And we'll pull this apart, but this is the purpose, right? Anytime you write any grant proposal, you have to understand the purpose of the funder in giving the grant. So even though we're gonna be talking about careers across these four sessions, Amanda and I are gonna be throwing in a lot of general grant writing stuff you need to know. And then how, the, how does that apply to a career? You have to know the reason that the funder is giving the money, right? So let's pull this apart. So the career program has three interlocking parts that all kind of work together to make the proposal. So you have your research, your education plan, and then that needs to work together to lead to advances in the field or in the mission of the uh, directorate. So the thing that people forget about that, the research always has to be, of course, mission relevant to NSF. But what people forget for careers is that there's a third piece to this, and that is your department or organization. In other words, your department at Iowa. Yes. Right. And that's what people really forget. So there's the other part of this is that NSF's goal here is to set you on a trajectory. So your research plan has to be solid and set you up for the next step. So not only does your research plan have to yield results for this proposal, but you need to tell them how it's going to keep you going. It's not a pilot project. Right, because it's it, five it, years. Yeah, and it's going to be the first step along your plan. And then your education plan has to integrate into your research for the longer term. So they don't want you just doing something and then forgetting about it and then moving on from it. You need to be able to show how that education plan is gonna continue, just like how your research plan is going to help you continue in your field. And again, we're talking about the mission of the department and your work and must be supported by the department. You have to have departmental support for your, not only just your research and education plan, but for you as a faculty member in your career. So in later sessions after the first of the year, um, we will talk about that chair letter that is absolutely critical to this. But in your planning part of this, you need to kind of figure out what is your department need. So we actually will show you a Venn diagram of a way to think about this. But we also think the why is super important. Like why was the career even created? And it was because of this. It's usually referred to as the Boyer Commission Report, but if you look for Boyer Commission Report, you only get references to it. What you really want is reinventing undergraduate education. We think you can find it here the last time we checked, which was two days ago. Yeah, it was yeah. still it's there. there so. But it does tend to move around sometimes. Yeah, and on the resources page, we put a link to it. And we also, um, one of our, our colleagues, Susanna Gal, um, made like a little summary of the the key takeaways of the Boyer support. And that is on your ATG resources page, right? So what they found was that um, education was getting really stratified. You'd have researchers up in their tower and then you'd have people teaching classes and there was no connection between what the researchers, the faculty were doing in their research and what they were doing in education. And so this is from back in the nineties. So just, this has been around for a while, but they want a, Students are learners and researchers as well as faculty, right? Synergistic system. So they're trying to basically establish a change in academic culture. 
right? The federal agencies do this all the time. The Fed, the government does this all the time, right? They wanted to change the culture around home ownership, so they introduced the interest deduction on your taxes. That's a way of using fiscal policy to drive social change. And so the same kind of thing happens with any kind of grant, right? NSF has been big on convergence research for a lot of reasons, but they're driving social change in science and how science is done with grant dollars. And this is, the career was one of the first ways that they explicitly did this. The culture they were trying to change was what I said before, researcher, tower, education, separate. Right? They're trying wanting this to be combined. So they want you to launch your career as this teacher scholar or researcher educator. These things are not separated. And this is why, as Amanda said, you can't come up with an education plan that you will only do through the duration of the five-year career. I love this, this is hilarious. Is NSF's ingredients of a good career. <laughs> Yeah, so they put this in. So if you go, I think on your um, handout, it's hyperlinked. So you can go and you can see the web, you can see the slides for the webinar. And this is what they say. This is all that you need to do is to do these four simple steps and you're fine. You're perfect. And I laughed. <laughs> because that's what it looks like from the program officer's perspective. Well, we're looking for these things. It's like, okay, that's great. Um, but how do you do it, right? And so especially pieces like that integrated plan requires planning. Yes. And that's why I think it's so great that, you know, Aaron and the career club brought us in early so that you've got time to think about this stuff so that when we talk about the rest of it, you might've actually put some of these pieces in place. So one way of thinking about your career application is that you're, and one way you should think about it is that your career application is planning your career. So there's, a, we talk about a lot about like five-year career plans or five-year plans, and that's essentially what your career application is, is it starts your five-year plan. So you have to think about, and this is what you should be doing over the next month or so, what is your long-term vision for yourself? I mean, literally, who do you want to be? Um, there's always the question also about differentiating yourself from your mentor. So what research trajectory do you want to use this career to set yourself up on? Um, what appeals to you in the education plan? Don't propose something you don't actually want to do. Just, because, think, oh, if, just because you think, I was going to say, don't, if you don't want to do it, you won't continue it through and it'll be painful every time you think about it. If you just put it in there because you think it will review well, it's not going to have all of the like serious infrastructure under it for reviewers to see it as legitimate, right? And we'll talk a lot about this, this integration piece. And throughout the course of this, Amanda and I have worked on a lot of careers and worked yes. with a lot of people. So we've got tons of examples from funded grants, so we can talk about them, uh, <laughs> of things that have worked, right? If you don't want to do this, if you don't want to be that researcher scholar, that you know that researcher educator, teacher scholar, um, then don't don't do it. There's other grants you can do. Um, there's NSF standard grants. Uh, there's the Eager program, which is the early. I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Yeah, no, no, no. High risk, high payoff. Yeah, basically, they're a lot shorter. Um, they're mostly reviewed just internally at NSF. They don't usually go to peer reviewers. Um, but also we'll talk about timing. You should always think about a standard grant because that's, that's a useful thing to have in your pocket. But this integration is critical. And here's the other thing people don't think about when they think about careers. Um, I see your question and I will get to it just a sec. Um, sorry, I have attention deficit disorder and um, sometimes I will snipe myself by doing that. So pardon me, I'm pulling myself back on track. All right, so the two review criteria, we'll talk about review criteria for NSF, but they're intellectual merit 
um, and broader impacts. And those are used to judge both the research and the education plan. So your education plan has to have intellectual merit, not just impact. When we review these, a lot of times we find that the education plan is written and it talks a lot about the impacts, but very little about the intellectual merit of it. Like, why did you choose to do it? What are the best practices? What literature are you basing it on? Yeah. And so NSF tends to um, put the review criteria as questions. Oops. So you always need to look at these questions, right? And so they come down to five words. These are the same as across almost every funding agency. Uh, Falk, Krasinski, and Tobin published this in 2015, where they 2015, where they um, they looked at all the published federal review criteria, and the most common one are these five. So will it have an impact? Is there innovation? Is the plan likely to work? Are you likely to be successful and can you do it where you are? And again, these are true for both the research, which we expect, and by the way, my handwriting does not get better, um, but also for education, sorry. In the education plan, you need to make sure that you answer those questions for each part. Yeah. So um, is it essay or okay? Ej, thank you. Appreciate that. All right, Ej. Um, the funding rates are. We are actually going to show you the the most recent data that we can find for funding rates. They differ across the various parts of NSF, and in some cases, funding rates for careers are higher than standard grants, and in some cases, they're lower uh, because NSF isn't a monolith. It's made up of a pile of rocks. <laughs> right. So it depends on which rock is here. Which rock is your home base? <laughs> okay. Idea generation is critical. Sorry. So I have heard program officers at NSF grant meetings say, oh, we want to see your blue sky vision. Yes. That your career should be ambitious and should. Yes. You know, where are you going? And it's like every time somebody does that, you know what the reviewers do? Boom. Yeah. Because the reviewers think that, hey, it's great, it's novel, but it's not doable. Or we have no idea what you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think a lot of times when I'm reviewing a, a proposal by a young investigator, um, I have I should just basically create a macro for this because I say, what, comma, exactly, comma, do you plan to do? <laughs> right, so when you give the blue that blue sky vision, um, then somebody's left with, well, that's nice, but I don't know what like what happens when you walk in in the morning. So we need some sense of that, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by setting you up on the on this trajectory. And so this timeline um, is pretty interesting. There's a bunch of there's a book a resource that's linked for you out there um, that is. Is it Jay-Z Pay? I never remember if I get the initials right. But he put together this PDF of articles written by people about careers. And they are still all pretty good and pretty true. I think I got this example from uh, somewhere else. But the particular example was in year one through five. So this was their career. They were going to be doing the basic material science on, on their area of interest. And then the next steps were where they were looking at translation. And then like the 10 to 15 year, they were actually projecting going for an NSF goalie, which is a really interesting mechanism that's a combination of laboratory and industry. It's, they're very, very cool. Um, but this person had a really strong sense of where they wanted to be even by year 15. So what is this setting me up to do? And we'll talk about how much money is in a career. It's not a lot. Right? So you want to be thinking about, I've got five years so I can be kind of creative, but it can't be super resource intensive because the budgets aren't that big. Right? But this might be where the standard grants start coming in.
the other part of this is context for it, like the education activities. And this is, we're quoting from the NSF solicitation here. There's a lot of ways that you can do your education plan. So they say K-12, undergraduates, could be grad students or the general public, but there's some caveats here we gotta give you. The first one is K-12. Yeah, please don't say that you're gonna do this in K through 12 students because I have a, I have a seven-year-old who's in first grade and I have a 10-year-old who's in fifth grade. And even the difference between K and five is pretty big. And then if you jump up to the next to middle school versus elementary school, the gap even widens. So what you do for elementary school will not work for high school. So if you put that on your research or in your education plan, the very first question I will ask you is, which subset of K through 12 students will you do this with? Because a five-year-old is very different than an 18-year-old. Or a middle schooler from a high school senior. I mean, just, you know, vastly different. Um, you know, Amanda's kids are young, mine are launched, um, just, just launched. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. So don't do that, <laughs> right? So the caveat about undergraduates is you can't just say, oh, and I'm gonna talk about my research in the context of my undergraduate courses. You should say that, mm -hmm. but it is insufficient. You do not have to have an undergraduate focused education program, but we have seen some really good ones. So for example, um, funded, uh, funded Career Award that I worked on, her, education plan was to add into her undergraduate um, course that they were going to go out and do field work on her real field site. So taking it out of the laboratory where everything's sort of artificial and then putting them in, no, we're doing the real research. We don't know what the answers are. And so it was a way for undergraduates to get out into the field to see how geology was really done. It furthered her research, but part of her research design were things that could be done by those undergraduates in that context. And so it was beautifully integrated with her research, but it was above and beyond her day job. Like talking about your research in your courses is kind of your day job, mm -hmm. right? Um, same thing with graduate students. Training grad students is your day job. What would you do different and above that, right? Kristen, I see your comment in the chat about your feedback, whether about targeting multiple levels of um, like K through 12 undergraduate and graduate students. I, I don't, without seeing your education plan, I'm not sure what you're planning on doing, but it would have to be tailored to the levels that you're working on. So you can't just say, I'm going to do this and then adapt it for undergraduate. Right. I mean, right. I can expound on that a little yes, bit. Yes, that'd be great. Yeah, great. So um, my original plan was focused primarily at the high school student level um, and the you know pre-application reviewer uh, basically suggested like well, you have to also incorporate undergraduates and graduate students in your education plan. It can't be just high school students, which I, I wasn't sure what your thoughts are about that advice. So there's a couple ways to think about that. One is, um, they're not wrong mm -hmm. because like I said, there's some things you should say, like we will be, you know, I will be incorporating my research into my undergraduate or graduate training. Like they're, you know, one of the biggest issues and, and I'm sorry to go off and be a little bit personal, but if you knew me in high school, the last thing you'd expect me to be was a scientist because I hated laboratories. And it wasn't until I had an experience to understand that we don't know everything, right? Laboratories or cookbook. I was utterly uninterested in cookbook. You know the answer. Why are you asking me to get the same answer you already know? I mean, that was just the way my brain works. But as soon as I was exposed to, we don't know the answer, but we need to have these techniques to have like a solid understanding of it. I switched from English to biology like that. Um, there's another story about the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, but I'll spare you. And here's the thing. Um, so that's where what you should do with your undergraduates because they are like coming out of that rote high school and so letting them know how science actually works or how your scholarship actually works and putting that into your courses would be adequate to incorporate more. Like you don't have to have a separate program, like a big program for, for high school students and then a big program for undergrads and big, because that, that's all you'd spend your time doing. That's not what they want out of this. In fact, we have seen careers ding because the education plan was too big, right? And, and my advice to the person was that's its own grant. 
<laughs> and she's like, I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. And the reviewers are like, you're never going to do anything else. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing with the graduate students, why can't you incorporate your graduate students in your um, high school outreach? That helps them with science communication. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are ways to kind of integrate it in so that you're not creating independent programs. Does that help? It's a good question. I'm really glad you asked it. Um, James asks, is it a concern if you don't teach? Kind of. James, I'm curious about your position. Uh, I'm a, a physician scientist. Oh. I'm going to be really honest with you. Um, this is a tough grant for a physician scientist to get. Um, are you an oncologist? Are you the one who put oncology in? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, so it'd be really interesting to think about how you might do that in a way that doesn't look like NSF would fund it. Right. So, and also if you're a physician scientist, your department chair has to really be on board with this. So we, um, Amanda and I do office hours afterwards, and I don't know if this will fit with your schedule since we're shifted an hour, um, but we can definitely talk about that. Yeah. Oh, Kristen, thank you. See, this is why we want all of you to use the chat. Did you see that? Oh yeah, that's great. That's really cool. Okay, you, you, you two connect, trade emails on, on direct message. <laughs> that's definitely gonna get you somewhere. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah. Okay, and then there's the general public. And we'll, we'll give you lots of examples of things like that the general public could do. But ideally, whatever you do is related to the research and most importantly, consistent with your career goals. And that your chair knows that these are your career goals and they're, they're engaged, like they're on board with it. So let's play around with this. Um, do y'all know how to use annotate? You can annotate my screen. So go in and annotate and draw connections for anything you think could be done. How would you connect any of these research activities with any of these act educational activities? We got one. Annotate's sort of fun. Yay! And don't worry if somebody else already drew the connection. It's interesting to see where they where they double up. Oh, I like that. Yeah, this is fun. So you could definitely see where some things would be pretty localized, like the hiking trail and geology. And some of these could be adapted for anything that you wanted to do. When we talk later about, um, about how you evaluate things, actually, I think we should probably give them a, pre a, a preview of yeah, that. Yeah, we should. Yeah, we should definitely give you a preview of that. So I'm going to switch um, the share really quick um, and go to the whiteboard. As you are thinking about what you want to do, figure out who your audience is. So, yeah, go ahead. I was going to. So, what your audience is. So, this would be, you know, elementary, high school students for Kristen, um, what behavior you're looking at that you want to change. So that's knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So the behavior change could be they have new knowledge, they have new skills, or you have a change in attitude, right? And then the condition under which you're doing this, I don't know if you're going into like classes or if you're having some sort of like 
summer program, but whatever condition that is that you're doing this under. And then degree. So you have to be able to measure that change. And so here, so here's an example. Um, there was a person who decided that his outreach audience was business people. And the, the knowledge, skill, behavior, attitude that he wanted to change, he wanted to change their attitude about the value of basic science, the value of their taxpayer dollars going into, you know, what some senators pull up as being ridiculous investments that turn out to be great. So Golden Goose Awards. Have you heard of the Golden Goose Awards? Oh, so these are things that look like ridiculous basic science and they turn out to be super important. Um, like the cricket hearing one. Um, mm -hmm. You know this one? Oh, this is so cool. All right, neuroscientist here, total nerd. Um, but the way that we know where things are in space is because of the distance between our ears and the length of sound waves and really beautiful neuronal architecture with delay lines that mean like it hit here first and then it hit here, but it hit, it's hits together at the same space in the ponds. It's really, really cool. Sorry. Um, all right. So that's how we know where things are in space. And owls are even weirder because their ears are offset. So that's how they get the 360. Fine. Crickets' heads are this big. They know where things are in space. The physics doesn't work. How do they do that? Right? And so based on how people understand, you know, funded research, NSF funded research, um, my son's godfather is deaf in this ear, but he wears what looks like two hearing aids. This is actually just a microphone and a complex signal processor. This is... Um, a microphone like this one is, but it's also a speaker into his ear and a complex signal processor. They're Bluetooth together. He hears out of one ear. He knows where things are in space, thanks to crickets, right? So this is the kind of story you can tell business people to say, look how much money Bosch and Loam is made off of these, these things that would not exist if we didn't understand how crickets figured out how where things were in space. So that was, that was what he's trying to do is change the attitude. So the condition was, he had this little dog and pony show with several examples of this and back before COVID. And I don't know how they do it now, but, you know, business people's service clubs like Kiwanis or Civitan, or, you know, you see the signs outside of, you know, Iowa city as you're driving in, um, or, if, you know, if you're going up to Cedar Rapids and they'll have little signs like lions club or this. And so their luncheons are always looking for like a 20 minute speaker. And so he had a 20 minute dog and pony show. And that was the condition. He offered himself up to be scheduled to these business people's luncheons. And then how did he measure the degree of change? Well, he had like a little sheet on at their lunch place. What do you think of these four experiments, right? They're ridiculous waste of taxpayer money. And then after he talks, what do you think, right? So super simple evaluation before and after, did their attitudes change at all? Right, so this gives you a sort of a concrete example of understanding one, we're going to talk about this. You have to know what you're doing so that you can evaluate it. And so identifying your audience, the behavior that you're trying to change, you know, knowledge imparted, skills gained, attitudes changed, how you're doing it, and then how you're going to measure what changed. Right. So this is that's a super helpful way to start thinking about. What do you do when you're choosing and thinking about the education plan that you want to have? Does that everybody, does that make sense for folks? Okay, great. Any questions on that before we do this? Do this next step? I hope that helps. We're, we're trying to demystify the whole education plan thing. Okay. All right. So like Peg said before, the NSF is not a monolith. It's made up of a pile of rocks. So you've got to understand which rock you fit with at the NSF. And every directorate has divisions, right? Um, you want to understand who can qualify for this grant. Um, so first things first, you do not have to be a US citizen or green card holder. Yay. You have to be pre-tenure and on the tenure track or tenure equivalent. So those are the, those are the basics. Okay. Um, so figure out where you fit and then look at careers in your area. So I just, 
every career has to start with this word in the title. And then you can go, great. Then you can go down to which part of NSF. So if you just want to look at MPS, Mathematics and Physical Sciences, you can uncheck all the rest of these and research, and then you'll just get the MPS careers. But you should always look at ones that are already funded in your area to get a sense of scope and of what kind of ed plans seem to be working. Um, you don't need this link. You can just go to the NSF website and they have um, a place where you can look at funded grants. Super easy. Oh, Amanda, thank you. I had to look it up a couple of days ago, so. Okay. All right, so the other thing to remember, and the reason we bring this up is that the cultures around career vary across NSF. And this is a slide from an old NSF pr um, presentation. So if it comes straight out of NSF, I put their logo on it, not because they're endorsing what we're saying, but we're telling you where we got it. Um, but things like this, the award size vary. And on this, when you look, when you go and click on that, you'll get a sense of how much money it is. Like, look at this award amount. There you go. Um, scope will change. So you have to look. There's definitely norms around this and talk to your community contacts. In fact, you really wanna to talk to your program officer. It's very important. It's in the solicitation five different times we counted. We think they mean it, <laughs> right? So when you click this link, this is what you get. So there's the directorate contact, who's the overall of all the careers, but then, like we said, there's divisions within the directorates. So you wanna to go to your division contact probably first, right? So here's size, there's directorate contacts, but then within the specific divisions, there's contacts. Now, this also brings me to something kind of just as a, it's not meant as a sidebar, but we said that every part of NSF is a little different around the career. And so, NSF does, or not NSF, um, size, computer science, doesn't really think that much about careers. Um, in fact, they're, they're like, yeah, you can apply for a career, but we've created our own computer science specific early career award, and we want you to apply for that, right? So it's all very different. No letter of intent is required. So how do you talk to a program officer? So we would suggest that you email them first because anybody who's like me and in today's world, you don't want to just call them up because they could be busy. They could be in the middle of all sorts of different things. So you want to send them an email and tell them that the purpose of your call is that you want to request, or sorry, the purpose of your email is to request a short 15 minute brief, just something to let them know that you're not going to be on the phone with them for an hour and a half. And then tell them that you plan to submit for the career award. And then you want to tell them that your goal is to determine the program, program rel programmatic relevance of your project that you're proposing. And then briefly describe your project. So it might be a one paragraph. It might be a white paper that you've already written. You know, there's a lot of ways that this could go. And if you're going to attach anything to the email, make sure you still describe what your project is in the email, and then you can attach it because the program officer may or may not download attachments, depending on how worried they are about spam or viruses. But also, a lot of times they'll read through your email, set up a time to talk to you, and they won't look at it until like five minutes before your call is scheduled, and they'll just bring it up right away. And the reason you want to say something like brief short 15 minutes is so that they don't, so that they know that you know <laughs> that the purpose of this conversation is not for you to go on an hour long description of your research, right? Because we all know that researchers, if you give them a chance to talk about their research, will talk and talk and talk for hours. Mm -hmm. if you let them. So they want you to, like Peg said, you're letting them know that you know that they don't have an hour to listen to your research. But what you want to do is the main thing that you're interested in is program relevance, because even for careers, your program officers and NSF have priority areas. 
Um, and so sometimes there may be things you want to propose to do that they are not interested in funding, or they've already got three of those funded, right? They never fund anything twice, basically. Um, another piece of that potentially to think about is um, sometimes things are very hot button and politically they won't fund it. And you want to know that before you've written an entire proposal. Program officers are human. Um, they exist on a, on a continuum. You have some that you'll send that email to and then like 15 minutes later, you're getting a phone call. Oops. And they will talk to you. Yeah. You have some that you will email and you will never hear from them. And then you've got some in the middle that may just copy and paste in something that they commonly say. It really depends on the culture of that particular directorate or division as to how your program officer will respond. Right, and some of them like social and behavioral sciences, they often don't respond at all because they have way many more applicants than they have any, any sort of money to try to support. Um, also, many program officers might be um, rotators. So they come and they work at NSF for two years and then they go back to their institution. And so if they're like three months away from rotating out, they don't want to list, you know, you're not their problem. But we recommend you do this about six months ahead of time. That you reach out initially six months ahead of time. It can be four months, but it shouldn't be one month. No. It's too late if it's one month ahead of time. Yeah, because one month ahead of time, you've already written your proposal. And if they say, hey, we're not interested in this subject or we've already funded something like this, then you've already written the whole thing and you can't go back and retool it. Well, at least yeah. not without pre not well. Yeah, not yeah. well. All right, any questions on program officers before we wander off this one? I do have one actually that I was typing, but I'll be faster if I say it. Oh, okay, great question. Um, if it's your second time applying, do you recommend waiting until you get reviews back and then contacting the program officer? Is that the play? Okay. Yeah, that's the play. Um, yeah, we talk, okay. I'm sorry, I'm trying to filter down to the like most succinct, succinct things I can say about revising proposals. Um, one, take a look at the reviews highlight everything that they liked so you don't change it and that you don't fail to notice it. Um, figure out what you think they got wrong. Don't get mad or, or like put it away and, and come back. Don't, don't talk to your program officer when you're mad. Never blame the reviewers, never insult them because your program officer assembled that panel. And by proxy, you're insulting the program officer, right? So don't complain about the reviewers. Um, what you do wanna think about is, is it worth resubmitting, like, do you want to see this again? Um, they were in the room when it was discussed. So one of the questions I asked, and I don't know what little, you know, happy angel was sitting on my shoulder to ask this question, but I said, you know, there's like eight sentences in this resume and summary of discussion. Was there any one particular area that the reviewers spent most more time discussing? And it turned out that one of those eight sentences was 50% of the discussion. And I never would have known if I hadn't asked that question. So that's the kind of question you can ask. You can't say who said what, but you can ask questions that do not violate confidentiality. So where did they spend their time? Or was there one particular point? That's a fair question. Do you happen to know um, when those reviews become available? I think it's maybe January, but I'm having a hard time finding that info. I don't know off the top of my head, but it should be by January. Yeah, I mean, you, you put them in in July. They're probably reviewed sometime in the fall. And the, you don't always get the raw reviews. Uh, sometimes program officers will read through them. And this is a direct quote, remove egregious personal remarks. Yeah. They don't always have to, but they do look. Anything else on program officers before we go off? I just wanna make sure we don't leave any questions behind. Okay. You wanna find out how it's reviewed. Yes, that's gonna factor into how your reviewers read your proposal. Mm -hmm. 
So if the panel, oh, go ahead, Amanda. I was gonna say, so if you have a career panel, so that's gonna be more broad than your typical panels, um, they're all going to be very, you know, they're all gonna be very smart, but they're not gonna be in your field or may not be in your field. So you need to write it more generally to where the technical aspects of the proposal can be understood by somebody who's not in your direct field. Yeah. And so you think about it, you know, say a program officer recruits me to mm -hmm. review Christie's proposal and review, you know, rec because I'm pretty close and recruits Amanda, um, you know, to look at John Ling's proposal. And, but because they want multiple reviews on each proposal, even though I'm not an expert in John Ling's field, I may get it to review and Amanda may get Christie's to review. So you see why you have to write it for a slightly broader audience if you know it's gonna be only careers. It also means that they're gonna be looking at education plans, apples to apples. And in, in a standard panel, you're gonna have people who are more in your field. So they're gonna have that scientific um, expertise relevance in your area. So you can write it a little bit more um, for a more specific audience. But then it's more helpful if your education plan really dovetails into your research because then they're not looking at a separate, like here is an education plan and every almost everything else they're reviewing is a standard grant, right? Mm -hmm. So the more, so like the case of the person who had the students actually doing the work out in the field, that was a case where it was reviewed in a standard panel. It wasn't reviewed just with only other careers. And then like Peg was saying, a mix of ad hoc and panel, um, with ad hoc, you're gonna have people who are brought in who are specific to certain fields. So this was very similar to what Peg was saying about being recruited for one proposal and then having to read another proposal. Right. The, and, well, the ad hocs are brought in and that's all they, they just review the one proposal, mm -hmm. right? So, and they're not there in the room. So it's just the written, right? So an ad hoc reviewer sends in a written review but they rarely participate in the discussion. In fact, it's the, the job of the primary reviewer to present the ad hoc reviewers reviews. And you could have an ad hoc only. And so they're only going to be writing in the reviews and they send them to the program officer. And in that case, your program officer is going to have a lot more say in um, scoring of the proposal. Yeah, in, in the final funding decisions. So you also have to remember is that review is always advisory program. So program officers make the final funding recommendations and they write the accepts and declines. Mm -hmm. So um, so much so where the panels do not say the F word, they do not say funding at all. Not allowed. <laughs> So Casey's got, it. yeah, go ahead. Go for it. I'm going to drink some of my tea. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm making Amanda talk and she has a sore throat. <laughs> All right. So um, it's, it's not a function of the type of proposal. In fact, we can give you that information. It's really by directorate. All right. So most of GEO uses a mix of ad hoc and, and panel. Um, bio and social and behavioral uh, use ad hoc and panel. Engineering size, EHR, um, those are almost always dedicated career panels. MPS is going to vary a lot by division. So at astronomy and astrophysics, it just goes to the panel, you know, chemistry and DMR, it goes to ad hoc and panels. Material science goes mostly to panels. Physics is mostly ad hoc, right? And this is a this is the recent slide, but that information hasn't changed over the past I don't know six eight years. So, so that that would be a question to pose to a, a program officer um, during that initial during that, initial yeah. contact. <laughs> yeah. So you know, and, and you can ask this, right? So you, you if you're in engineering, you know it's going to go to a career panel. It's like very unlikely it won't. And, um, but the other ones, you're, if you're not really sure, you know, if there's a mix, just, you know, letting me, letting you know, 
Now, I, I've gotten into arguments with people about whether or not this information is relevant. Um, where I got this information and where I learned that to maybe stress it a little bit more was in fact somebody who oversees careers at the NSF and has a lot of experience with how these things are reviewed. So. Okay, so we put the link to the FAC on the page. It's also hyperlinked in your handout. Uh, we put the, the Jay-Z pay book, but almost all the information on the web really you know, applies to engineering. And that is not great um, because if you're going to bio or SBE, the cultures around this are very, very different. Okay. All right, we're gonna leave that for the moment. And we always take a five minute break at the top of the hour. So everybody can get a stretch, recaffeinate as you need. Um, if you have to leave because we got our timing shifted, remember that this will be recorded and will be available for you. And otherwise, we will see all of you back at five minutes after the hour. Sound good? Absolutely. Can I have some questions? Um, sure, Shuji. Uh, oh, maybe I guess you need to take a break. I'm sorry, I shouldn't hold you. Yeah, go take a break. You got okay, If you have time hour. after, we. We always do office hours and we, we will have some time built in for questions the next hour. Yeah, are you gonna be able to stay for the next hour? Uh, I, I hope so. Okay. Okay, yeah, you, you deserve some break. I'm sorry, I shouldn't hold you. Okay, yeah. <laughs>
No, folks. Everybody recaffeinated and stretched. Yes. <laughs> All right. Mm, more coffee. Um, <laughs> never tell anybody that it's half decaf. <laughs> uh, ruin my reputation. All right. So here we go. This is the number of career proposals. Now, this data, these data used to be presented every year um, when NSF did their regional grants meeting and they changed the person who does it. So we don't have any data sooner than 2018 um, that they've made easily public. But this gives you an idea of how many people put in career proposals in the various directorates of, of the National Science Foundation. And as you can see, most of them come in engineering, in math and physical sciences, and pretty much equally for um, computer science and bio. Not a lot in geo. Right? So this gives you a sense of that. Now, there's a the y-axis is going to change here. This is the funding rate. This is the success rate across the foundation. And I find that really pretty interesting. So you can see that like in geo and computer science, like 25% success rate or better, depending on the year. Even in SBE where, you know, they don't get a lot of proposals, they have a pretty good success rate, you know, 15% or so. Um, MPS of over 20%. Now the average across the National Science Foundation is about 20%. But um, I'm trying to think, Aaron, they got books. Yes, yes, they got books. Um, so when you look at the new chapter in the book, which is on resubmissions, there's some data that I was able to sort of dissect and pull out. For standard NSF grants, um, the funding rate on first submission is something like 4%. So even though the funding rate across the foundation is 20%, that means every grant is treated as one, but a big chunk of those grants are second, third, sometimes even fourth submissions, All right? So just be aware that this funding rate does not treat you, know, you as one instance, it treats every submission you make separately. And your resubmissions are naturally going to be better, right? Um, Yes. There's a joke that is not original to me, which is that resubmission is not a frequentist proposition. It's a Bayesian proposition. That means you change your priors. Okay. So let's talk about getting ready. Are you ready to go? And how do you plan to get there if you're not? Remember I told you that we would have a Venn diagram of the three pieces. So there is your research, there is your teaching, in the context of your department that all come together for a career. And there we go. Let's pull those pictures and kind of make it more verbal. So the first thing you do is you look at, well, the research you wanna do. You should have a research idea. Ideally, some indication of productivity in your new environment. That comes to timing, which we'll talk about. Cultures around this differ across the foundation, but a lot of people I know don't get their careers until they're fourth year professors, right? Partially because of submission and resubmission. Um, but we'll talk a lot about why we don't think you should go in on your first year in general, with the yeah. exception of, yeah, go ahead, Amanda. I, say, I just saw a, a tweet on Twitter, which I have a very nice Twitter feed. I don't have anybody else. I see a lot of people who are um, a lot of pets and a lot of people who write grants. So it makes me very happy. Um, but I just saw a tweet yesterday about somebody who was submitting a career, uh, career proposal. They had gotten feedback back um, about lack of productivity because they were only in their second year, I think. And they had started their lab during COVID. So thinking about that, and we'll, we'll, we'll sort of walk you through the steps. Um, that should dovetail somehow with your education idea. So one of the reasons also that we don't think you should go in too early is you have to have some indication that you have interest or skill in teaching. So James, this puts you sort of in an interesting position, but also means that you could try piloting some of your, your education plan ideas before the a proposal goes in 
And so that indicates to them, yes, I've tried it and I really want to do it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so also your synerg that, that would show up, by the way, for your biosketch and your synergistic activities, as well as in your description, like, oh, I've already started doing this kind of thing. Um, your synergistic activities can, okay, so also, sorry, another place where you're going to overlap is potentially like missing courses or activities that your department needs, right? So sometimes, you know, in some parts of NSF, they expect new course creation. Some parts of NSF, all you're doing is creating a new course. That's your job. You know, what, do, what are we going to see that's above your day job? So that's, again, why it's so important to know what's the norm in your part of NSF. But also you need to know what your institutional opportunities are. Like, what do they already do that you can leverage off of? Uh, for example, the Louis Stokes Alliance, are, you, are those familiar words to any, are those unfamiliar words? Casey's like, I've never heard of this. <laughs> okay. Um, so the LSAMP program, I don't know if we've lost Aaron. Um, it's the Louis Stokes Alliance and it funds undergraduate research or, you know, undergraduates from traditionally excluded groups in research. And so being a mentor on your LSAMP grant or the McNair scholars or any kind of research experience for undergraduates, like what does your institution already do that again, you can get involved with that's going to help you with your synergistic activities and can also help you potentially with your education idea. So priority areas for your institution, you were hired research-wise because you fill a need in your department, but then you wanna make sure that your education plan is also a priority area for your department. So all of these things have to come together for a career. So the other thing is who cares? <laughs> Every grant proposal has to answer that question. Who cares about the research you're doing, about your education plan, who is impacted? So what we're going to do is actually have you do a stakeholder exercise. And this is something I want you, Amanda, and I think you should hang on to this mm -hmm. as you're thinking through over the next month. And it's going to come back up when we talk about, you know, significance and things like that in the third session. So there's six questions. What is the problem that you're solving? Go ahead, Amanda. I was going to say, what is the problem? <laughs> so what are you going to do? Like, there has to be a problem that your grant is going to solve. There's a lot of proposals I see that don't ever tell me explicitly what problem they're going to solve. And that's both true for research and education, because the education, like um, Peg pointed on the previous slide, needs to fill some gap. And then whose problem is it? So that goes for both research and education. Like, why, like, to whom is it a problem? And then who cares about this problem? And they're not always the same people or the same groups as to whose problem it is it and who cares, because sometimes there's people who are directly affected by the problem that obviously care, but there's other groups that care about that problem as well. And then who doesn't care? And this can be just as important as the who cares problem because, or the who cares question, because maybe there's people who don't care that should care and that part of your work is going to be to help them understand that they need to care about your problem. So sometimes that can be your education plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be part of like um, the example Peg gave about the business people needing to adjust their attitude towards basic science. Like they need to care about that. Well, we need them to care about that. <laughs> All right, um, who is already in the space? That's both a competitor and a potential partner. Mm -hmm. And who isn't doing something about the problem or maybe in the way. So maybe opposing solutions to the problem. Can the education plan be directed toward policymakers? The answer to that is yes. And as a reviewer, I will need to be very convinced that you have access to them and that they will listen to you. So you can't just say, if, if I build it, they will come. There has to be, because intellectual merit and broader impacts apply to both education and research, 
the intellectual merit piece for me would be, do you have access to them? Will they engage with you? Do you have you know, some sort of track record of showing that they engage with you? So it's a good question. Mm -hmm. And this is something, by the way, this is why you wanna think about the, your education plan this early, if not a year ahead of time, because then it can help you set that stuff in place. And I'd say what Peg said about if you have access to the group or if they're going to listen to you holds true for any community partner that you might work with, because you don't want to come in there and just say, hey, I'm going to educate this group of people if they don't want to hear from you. All right, um, we're going to give you two minutes, grab a piece of paper, open up a window, and we want you to identify 20 stakeholders out of any of these categories, as many as you can hit, identify 20 potential people who care about or would be impacted by what you think you're going to do. All right, got the timer, Marissa? Ready. And All right, go. All right, that's time. So how many of you had trouble coming up with 20? How far did you get? So what we typically do at this point is break you out into pairs and we'll, we'll do trios. Um, and here's the thing, we want you not to talk about who your stakeholders are, but what it was like to define those stakeholders, all right? And we'll we'll put you out in groups and just kind of get a little bit metacognitive about what this was like for you. What did you learn? Yeah, I was gonna say, you can talk about what surprised you. Like, who did you have on your list or what did you have on your list that you weren't expecting to have? Yeah. Got them out? Okay, Marissa's sending you out. We will see you shortly. So do we have at least two people in everything? Yes, for sure, at least two. I'm just making sure that there's nobody hanging out by themselves. Yes, okay. Great. Yeah, because we're two minutes a piece. Hmm? Two minutes a piece? No, one, one minute. Yeah, I saw Aaron's, Aaron's yeah. note. I just got his email.
Do you want me to bring them back after two minutes or three then? If they're in trios. Three. Give them three. Rissa, our car is still missing. Your what? Oh. Your car? Yeah. Um, I told Marissa before this. Um, so Tuesday, Stefan's car broke down. So um, called roadside assistance. Tow truck came sometime after we left because they were backed up. Mm -hmm. Came and said that they took our car to the dealership in town. Stefan called the dealership yesterday to find out, you know, hey, like all the good stuff. They can't find it. They've checked their like their lot, like their entire lot new cars, service, dealer cars, random other cars. They've called um, this, the body shop that's next door. They've walked their lot. They've walked a lot of the other car, of the Volkswagen dealership that's not our car, like next door. Can't find it. Do you know who towed it? Mm -hmm. We know who towed it. And they say they put it in the Honda dealership. That really is a worst case scenario. I'm so sorry to hear that, Amanda. We have no idea what happened to it. Oh, man. But yeah, I just checked my messages and Stefan's like, yep, they still don't know. And I have a sore throat, so I'm like, yeah. I was telling Marissa, like, Marissa was like, this is just bad. I'm like, yeah, it's this week. Well, my, my kid, I think I told you, came home and announced he needed a COVID test. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, yeah. Oh. Joel and I were, like, scheduled to get our boosters on Sunday, and if we have a known potential exposure, you're not supposed to. When was he exposed? Like I don't know. He just basically came in, announced it, and, you know, went up to bed. Oh, okay. When he's in that state, you can't talk to him. Fair. Yeah. Are about done? Eight more seconds. Okay. All right, I'm gonna close up the rooms. Mm, they have 60 seconds. Here we go. So what was that like? Oh, some people are still talking. Juan, you look a little grim. Yeah, Juan, how was that for you? Or maybe you were just looking at your computer at something that came in. You just had a look on your face like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's first time to you know join the breakout rooms, so time so yeah, a little bit yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> what we're curious about was how was making the stakeholder list. I actually I didn't get the the idea, so I I need to figure out more. But um yeah, I'm I'm looking into the, the hearing aids industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to help to um, give some kind of method to tune, um, you know, properly. Yeah, so who cares about that? Who is impacted by that work, right? So it's industry, it's hard of hearing people, it's hard of hearing people's families, mm -hmm. right? There's some yeah. basic physics around it. So things that you might do for hearing aids might actually have a national security application in making better bugs in rooms. Mm. Right. I, so there's a lot like, boom, I can just, yeah. yeah. And, and so that's sort of the, the way that we wanting you to think. And this yeah, is yeah. really going to come back up in two ways. It's going to come back up in your education plan. If you don't have one yet, your who cares list can help you figure out who your audience is. And it's also going to show up when we talk about significance and broader impacts. So what was the experience like of trying to do a stakeholder list? That's what we're mostly interested in. So, mm. okay. So, so 
yeah so yeah. patients and doctors sometimes right but not right okay yeah um, so, okay <laughs> yeah i <laughs> got you Juan. okay yeah. uh, i do want to hear from from other folks about what they're oh, yeah sorry about that yeah. yeah it's okay no it's great um in making their stakeholder list so like okay so casey you came back pretty quick you were like i'm done what was that oh i mean i i um i found it a little bit you know when, when making the stakeholder list i struggled a little bit with um figuring out how much overlap there should be between different like groups of stakeholders for example like whose problem is it and who cares about it seems like they should be largely you know should be a large amount of overlap there mm -hmm. and how might i kind of differentiate those two categories um and okay. secondly whether you know uh the stakeholders might you know be kind of telling me a story about how i need to spin my proposal because you know if this if it's a lot of dod people is nsf going to pick up on that and say hey why aren't you sending this to to them this isn't really mm -hmm. our except that national security is a listed potential um broader right. impact mm -hmm. right so yeah but that so here's the thing so sometimes people whose problem it is don't care about it mm -hmm. Right, so climate change is everybody's problem. But there's several people in my state that do not care about it, and I'm in Florida. Yeah, and actively work against it. That's okay, I'm in Massachusetts. We are not the bastion that you think we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially not where I live. So how was it for, for, for other people? Kristen, how was it for you just to start thinking about your stakeholders? You, you asked me, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. We so have a question. And yeah. I really struggled with this exercise. I remember it being really difficult. Uh, it was much easier this year now that I've actually written my first application mm -hmm. and kind of done the, the hard work of, of having to think about the stakeholders a lot more carefully during the writing process. So, yeah. Did anybody, was anyone who's done this for the first time, were you surprised at what came out? No. Yeah, it's the first time for me. Yeah. So what did you what did you learn, Shuji, that you didn't already know? I thought that only myself here and my lab here. Now I can think about that at least the, maybe the doctor's patient and uh, maybe my department and my mentor. I think I can, but still not 20, <laughs> only eight. <laughs> When you force this, it's like one of those creativity exercises, like find 20 things you can do with a paperclip. Um, and when I do team science trainings, sometimes we'll, we'll have people like if we're in person, there's a big post-it and we're like, okay, come up with 20 stakeholders, go. And I was working with a group of astrobiologists, which is like, I just love the fact that there are astrobiologists. And it took them until number 18 to come up with a potential stakeholder of Elon Musk. Right. So get creative when you do these. It doesn't have to be like the astrobiologists. They may not be working directly with Elon Musk. They may never solicit his input, but what they're doing might interest him. Pot potentially in funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So we're going to do your the little. OK, how do we think about this? Um, and you really have to do some self-assessment to make sure that you are ready to go, all right? And so this is our sort of star formation of all the pieces that come together to make a, a strong career for you, all right? So as always, that's the most important thing. The idea is paramount. Mm -hmm. So if you've been with me before, you probably already know the answer to that, but. Um, Anybody know what this is? You can take a guess, drop it in the chat. Or unmute, I don't care. What is this? It's not Actually, Juan cool. got it. Juan got it. Right, first it's, it's a diamond, an uncut diamond. Um, and so when Amanda and I review proposals, particularly careers, um, we're going to recommend next time when we come back together that you have 
two research aims and one education aim. Because quite often, this right here is aim three. Yeah, it's that thing that's just kind of bolted on to the proposal where it's like, oh, this all seems like a good idea for my research, but I can't quite fit it in the other two aims. So I'm yeah. attach it. And even though we're not gemologists, and even at this poor resolution, we can see that there are flaws in this crystal. Right. How many of you have submitted proposals and then resubmitted them? So yet yeah, in your career. Okay. How many times, just curious, James or or Kristen, either one who wants to pop in, was the resubmission smaller in scope than the initial submission? Did you get the feedback that it was an ambitious proposal? Oh, you're good. So Kristen got ambitious. You know what ambitious means, right? Yeah. So the <laughs> Robitech is like, uh -huh. <laughs> right. If it's ambitious, it's too big. And so to get from this idea that's got lots of pieces into it to that really clear gem, you're going to have to cut stuff away and make it clear. And your best input for doing this is, what's the best way to get from that to this? You can unmute it, it's fine. We're a small enough group now. Get people to read it and give you feedback. Yes. yes. Your colleagues, yep. Now, once you have that rock, though, it's not really very good, right? So, you know, Amanda, if I had just a, I, I'm going to give Amanda a diamond. <laughs> what do you think, Amanda? Would you like a diamond? Thank you. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but thanks. Right. So if you're going to wear it, right, it needs to be in a robust setting. And the setting is the proposal. And some of it's more important, like the first piece of setting for your your idea is that first page, the overview page. And when we come back together, we're actually gonna spend the entire two hours on just the first page. That's how important we think it is, right? Um, but then everything else would be things like the research plan, the background. For a career, it's also gonna be the education plan. Right, and all the other stuff is important, like the facilities and other resources, um, the bios, those all matter. Um, and we're not gonna lecture much on that. There's, there's some things that are relevant to the career about facilities and bios pages that, that Amanda and I will talk about in the last session. But basically this is the setting. The proposal is the setting for your idea because the idea alone isn't enough. They have to think that you can do it. The setting holds up the idea so it catches that light and shines pretty but then they believe that you can do it and if you've got it on your finger and you go washing dishes it's not going to fall out so i think we pushed the metaphor pretty hard yeah, we did. <laughs> okay um and but an excellent grant application provides a setting for an outstanding idea that's just the bottom line and the thing is with careers, it's a little bit different because you have these two integrated ideas. And that is, right, your education plan, your research plan in the setting of the department. So with your idea, your research program has to be innovative, but not too sky blue, right? We have to have a really serious understanding that it will work. It builds on your strengths from previous work, but it has to depart because you have to show that separation from your mentor and your research trajectory that's you're here and it's going to get you over here. Um, this is if you've had prior NSF funding, this is particularly true. And there's a point that I want to make about that, which is um, for NSF funding, you for or sorry, for a career, there's an urban myth, and I'll, we'll probably say this again, but there's an urban myth that you can't have had a prior NSF grant, whereas the data show that having had a standard grant actually increases your chances of winning a career. But what they're looking for is you had the standard grant and they want the career to be the thing that you do to open up new lines of research. Like it rests on what you know how to do, but it's taking you in a new direction as well. I mean, think about it. How many lines of research did your mentors have going when you were in grad school? 
<laughs> James went, I got jazz hands. On James. <laughs> Kristen's like, I'm not sure I can even count that high. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Edge is like, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. So they had a lot going. And so how do you establish those? And, and so if you've had a standard grant, they're looking for you to use that career to branch out more, but it still has to be relevant to their programmatic interests. Right. Feedback, like we said, is very important to the idea. Um, you guys are really lucky having that career club because you'll get the feedback from your colleagues. Um, in places that don't have this, we often recommend that they form something like this. Um, I had a friend of mine who established this um, at her own department where they would just take turns once a month over lunch. They would get up, they'd either have a whiteboard where they would just bullet point out their ideas or maybe they'd have a couple of slides of data and they would get feedback from everybody. And there was lunch. So everybody was happy because they got free food and a chance to critique. And mm -hmm. that's what academics love. About a dozen years ago, I was, I was at your institution and I met somebody who was in a group of a cluster hire, or they were all hired like right around the same time. And they called themselves the new and nearly new club because it didn't start until like the second or third year into this hiring process. So they were the new and nearly new. But they really created that same kind of collaborative group that Amanda's talking about, where they weren't necessarily collaborating together, but they were all working together to succeed. So sometimes they collaborated, sometimes it was reading each other's grants, and they all did way better than average. They all did, because they created that among themselves. Right? And this is the reason why Peg was so, you know, um, emphasized that joining this career club is a really great thing for you all because you'll be able to get that feedback and be able to possibly establish collaborators, get ideas, all of that. Also, you want people in this group who will be honest mm -hmm. and tell you the truth. Now, there's something that came across my Twitter feed that I thought was just beautiful. And it was somebody, somebody wrote, they asked me to be brutally honest, but I have found that honesty rarely requires brutality, right? You can be truthful without being personal. <laughs> so. so this is what you're going to need to do. And this is something that I'm going to, you know, recommend that you do between now and the next time we come together is think about what do you want to do? and what that's gonna set you up to do. So this is why your idea is important in this context is that you're thinking, what if I did this, I could do this, I could do that, right? And then what your ultimate goal is, like, why are you trying to do this? Right. All right, so that's the idea. Let's talk about skills. The skills show that it can be doable. So if you don't have all the um, skills that you need for this project that you want to do, or you think that maybe your publication record won't reflect that you have the skills that to do all of this, you have a couple of options. You can find a collaborator or a consultant that has those skills and that will, that will either say, hey, they can come do it with me, or they'll vouch for you saying, if you have any issues, it's fine. They can come and ask me. Right. So the letters for careers are we'll talk about them. They can yeah, only say anything. Different. Right. But, and so they, they can't say anything other than it says what I'm going to do, but like collaborators for careers have to have small roles. Cause this is really an investment in you. I think we didn't say this, and this is important. You are a product of this grant as much as the research is. Right. And so if you have a collaborator, they've got to have a relatively small role. So it's better to have a consultant and write into the proposal somebody's doing, you know, we have this person, who, like Amanda Welch is the world's an expert in, in such and such C letter of support, they will be available to me for any consultation, right? Um, you can find training opportunities. It's a little weird to write those into careers, but I've seen people do it to say that as part of this award, I'm going to go attend a Cold Spring Harbor course or, or something like that. Um, a consultant is not necessary. It's only if you look at it with your most critical outside yourself hat on, like what would somebody else see when they're looking at this? And they're not going to believe I can do it. I've never published this technique. Great. I've got somebody who's going to consult with me. Right. 
And that's also like a tr- almost a training opportunity for you is they're going to be consulting with you and providing some mentoring, ideally. But again, you're going to want to show that this is setting you up for the future. And that's why branching into something a little bit new is not a problem with careers this, the way it might be with a standard grant. Right? It's just you want to back it up. And I don't think we can emphasize this enough that the education plan has to be a plan. It can't be something that's just thrown in at the last minute. Yeah, we can always tell. Mm-hmm. So here's our flow chart. Do you have an idea? If yes, then operate, then figure out how you're gonna operationalize it. If no, then ask yourself these questions. What does my institution or department need? Um, I accidentally hit the captions and stuff. Okay. <laughs> what does my institution already do? And then what do you want to do? Hang on a sec. I'm going to have to get out of the whole thing. Okay. So you want to think about what you want to do. So that way you're, like we said before, you're implementing an education plan that's something that you want to do as opposed to something that you feel is imposed upon you because if it feels imposed upon you it's not going to be as well developed and you're not going to stick with it as much and you're and we can always tell when by the end of the proposal you're gritting your teeth through any of this yep all right so i'm back okay (laughs) okay so again yeah go ahead and you can think about your stakeholder list what do they need or what do they care about that your education plan can help fulfill So if your answer is yes, this is the operational piece. Do you have a plan? If yes, can it be evaluated, which we've talked about before, but I think we're gonna briefly run through again. If no, then ask yourself these questions. What resources do I need? What's my institution already have that I can use? And then this is really important for the education or for the intellectual merit part of this what are the pedagogical underpinnings of what you wanna do? Because the education plan has to have that intellectual merit piece, which means that you need to be able to look at best practices and other things. You have to include citations in your education plan, which is something that I've seen a lot of where people just write and there's absolutely no citations. Oh, can I tell you the saddest thing? Mm-hmm. It was, I don't know, this is a dozen years ago. But there was a person I was working with on his career proposal who's an engineer, and he brightly informed me, I had read his proposal, that he had figured out why women tend not to persist in engineering. He figured it out all by himself. Okay. And they do better when they have hands-on work from the very earliest classes. And I leaned back and I said, do you know how much literature already exists on exactly that point? Right. So usually like I've, I've had cases where I've come up with a, an education idea that I think is great, but then I go see if there's any literature on it. And I'm always super happy when there is, cause it means, oh, I was on the right track and the papers will help me like even make it better. Cause they've got data around it. So don't feel sad if somebody's already come up with your idea. That means you've got best practices and data as to why you want to apply it in your unique situation. So again, we talked about ABCD, we kind of jumped through that. So the audience at the rock show, the behavior is dancing, the condition is they're at a rock show, and the degree is, do you want number dancing or vigor of the dancing? Just super quick way to think about that. Okay. So here's a whole bunch more possible education activities, right? Some of them you've seen before. Um, there's so many things you could do. Yeah, there's ahead. so many different things that I've seen yeah. for this. Um, the four yeah, H groups actually I've seen used for citizen science. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a, I've even seen like teachers coming in. Like, so you're not working with the students, but you're working with the teachers to create some sort of module that they can bring back to their students. Yeah, in fact, you can hire high school teachers as research assistants okay. for the summer. Right. Never ask a teacher to do anything you're not paying them for, by the way. 
<laughs> they're underpaid and especially if it's the summer but they're not going to be expensive research assistants and as the course so there's you'll have two two things that you're doing with that one is they get hands-on experience in research and that reinvigorates their excitement and the second is you work with them to create something they take back into their classroom but that you can also disseminate like they could take to a teacher's conference and disseminate, hey, here's the thing that we do now in my classroom. And so that that's a kind of high impact thing that um, you can get creative and think about. So I'm actually going to skip this and have you guys think about this um, on the month because we've we've had some really good discussions and I want to make sure that we and that we land on time. Right. This is just to reinforce this is not our opinion. No, what I said before when I said that there should be citations around best practices, et cetera, I wasn't just making it up. This is, comes from the MSF directly. They ask about references, reference cited from your research and your education plan. All right, can you do it where you are or do you have the environment to do it? So here's, there's a couple of things that relate to that. It means a lot of different things. Some of it's obvious, right? Yeah, you have physical facilities. What do you have? Cores, services that your you, that your university uh, provides. Mm -hmm. Do you have an intellectual environment? This is going to come up when we talk about the chair's letter. Are there other career awardees? So when we talk about the facilities, talking about those people is pretty useful. Um, but it also means like. Do you have access to the group that you want to work with? So say you wanted to do something with, um, you know, blind students at a summer camp. The first question I'm going to ask is, do they even want you there? <laughs> you know, do, have you talked to them? Do you know, do you have a relationship with them? That sort of thing. So it means a lot of different things. Yeah. I think that James or Kristen pointed out that James works with um, like a BME group. Mm -hmm. Like if you're working with a club or a group at your university, you need to also say, state that you have a relationship with them or that they do want you to come in and talk with them. Mm -hmm. uh, good question. To be able to go to trainings to learn more. Yes, you can put that in your budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You might want to check with your program officer as to how that would come come together. Your intellectual environment, like these people that you talk to, those show up in facilities and other resources. Um, your access to your target group shows up in facilities and other resources as well. Your departmental support shows up in the letter. All right, we hate to talk about productivity, but we have to talk about productivity. That is the easiest reviewer heuristic is to ding you on productivity. Mm -hmm. <sighs> really handy flow chart that can help you with this. <laughs> All right. So here's the thing with NSF. Um, if you haven't ever done a National Science Foundation bio sketch, you can only put in 10 citations, five most relevant and five additional. And these are called products, not just not just papers. And so products can include patents. It can include software. Like if you created something that is up on GitHub or some similar um, platform and people are using it, you can count it. Um, unlike many places, and it was actually in Iowa where I learned this, um, submitted, you can include submitted papers on an NSF biosketch. Um, and they are real fans of the archive. So the preprint servers that you can find. Mm -hmm. For any of these, what's important is you have to have an electronic locator. It has to be um, sort of publicly accessible. Yeah. So even if it's a submitted paper, it's got to be accessible in some way, shape, or form and not on your personal website, which is why the preprint servers are so good. Yeah, the reason why it can't be on your personal website, as you all may know, is that if you might be able to track um, incoming people like inbound links, or if people have clicked on a particular link, like, you'll be able to see where they're coming from based on an IP address. And that could potentially de-identify reviewers. 
and nobody wants that. So when do you apply? We really feel like the first year is often too soon, but it is so completely dependent on which division or directorate. What we see is not a lot of success when you apply in your first year. Mm -hmm. You don't have a track record or your chair hasn't seen an improvement. You know, in a case where you don't have standard classroom teaching requirements, you won't have developed any kind of a sense of you know, and any kind of a track record in education, um, you don't know what your department needs, right? You're, you're new, you haven't really thought about what they could use. Uh, your chair doesn't know you yet. So the letter will read like boilerplate. That's not so helpful. Um, this is, you can ignore, ignore this advice. I have, I can argue this both ways and I've seen it work both ways. Um, but you can't accept a career if you have tenure, right? So if your very first submission is fourth year, then it's sort of like you're taking a shot at it, but it doesn't mean you really want it necessarily. But we always recommend that you budget for three submissions um, because as you know, the data that Amanda and I gave you is pretty clear that resubmissions are better than submissions in terms of funding rates. <laughs> but also, and I wanna credit this to Karen Kelsky, who blogs under the professor is in. And she had a client who said, okay, I'm just gonna assume it takes me three submissions. And so for every submission, I'm gonna be very conscious of what I can spin out of it, right? So can I get parts of a publication out of the work I put into the application? Can I take parts of the application and put that into an internal pilot award, right? Because from application to publication, not plagiarism, from application to application, not plagiarism. Publication to application without credit, plagiarism, right? So you can recycle these things a lot. Yeah. In fact, Peg and I are big fans of never doing anything for one reason. So even when you're doing like standard grants and applying for those, we often tell you to think about, okay, what can you use from this grant application in something else? Publication, another grant proposal, review article, whatever. So that question from James, um, that is somewhat less relevant, the, the first versus senior, mm -hmm. you know, it put in what you got basically. Cause I mean, you think about it, the, I'm reading this book called Epistemic Cultures and it's looking at the difference between <clears throat> like high energy physics and molecular biology and in, in terms of how the science is done. It's a fascinating book, but What's relevant to that is there are some things that are known to have cast of thousands, right? Because it's like genome or things like that. And it's like, we know it just takes a bunch of people to do this and your position is not necessarily all that relevant. Um, we saw one recently where the co-first authorship was determined by a mushroom picking contest. Yes. Like the order that, that came across our Twitter feed that cracked me. Uh -huh, that was great. Yeah. But the, on the other hand, like, you know, molecular biology, we really think a lot about who's the first author, who's the senior author, and it just varies, you know, across fields. So worry a little less about that. Oh, there's a Mario Kart. I would have been first author on that. <laughs> For those of you in fields who don't know this, there's this thing about co-first authorship, and I just sort of feel like it's a boondoggle, but that's my opinion. Um, Okay, but like I said, it's a myth that you can't get a career. So if you're not ready for the education part, but you want to put a grant in, put in a standard grant. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't get funded, you're going to get feedback on the science. Is that going to make your career better? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Even if it goes back to a different panel, you're still going to have that feedback and you're going to have an idea of what experts in the field think. Mm -hmm. So that we would strongly recommend that. Like if you're not ready to do a career, if, you, if your education plan would be half-hearted, just put in a standard grant. If you get it, great. If you don't get it, you've got feedback to make your career better, right? Because then you can start making those connections for your education plan, like James got today. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm super excited about that. Thank you, Chris. Um, read some ed literature, eric.gov. They have places where you can get that. If you can find anybody who's got a successful career application in your area, because this is super 
important. Um, and also just get to know your area of benefit staff. Read their websites, read their priority areas, spend, spend a half an hour poking around you know, your division. Um, is the role of pilot data similar? Um, I would say yes. Yeah. It all goes to show that you can do it, do what you're planning to do. It's proof of feasibility. And we'll talk a lot about pilot data in session three. All right, so we want to end with giving you an ideal grant writing timeline for a career. And we love this quote. This is from the First Peoples Cultural Council of, I can't remember which province in Canada. Um, but yeah, I love it because it's true. Stress kills the excitement and creativity because I, as I said just a little bit ago, Peg and I can tell when somebody is just gritting their teeth and they get to the end of it and they're just like, make it go away. They I hate the proposal. Yeah. So this is why we really think planning and setting yourself internal deadlines for things. There's like, I have grant writing on my calendar. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But um, yeah. All right. We'll get there. Um, we think you should start thinking a year in advance. Now, that's not necessarily, I mean, you're about six months ahead of time now, and that's okay. It doesn't mean you can't write a successful career. And in fact, with the support of the career club, you're in better shape to do that. But you want to start thinking about your now about your education plan and the potential partnerships you need. Right? And so that's what we would encourage you to use your thinking time for in the next month. Um, ideally, this is where where we're at. You know, if you've got regulatory issues, you're not doing them at the last minute. You're not doing your facilities page 15 minutes before it's due. True story, bro. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anybody who gives you advice is speaking to their younger selves. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I have, my younger self has lots of stories about this stuff. Yeah. And so this mock deadline of about a month, you don't have to have the full narrative written, but you kind of figure out what all the pieces are and that you need. Um, we think for time management, I like 90 minutes. Um, Amanda likes the Pomodoro method. Mm -hmm. Keeps me on track from going down rabbit holes. This is the most important thing. Put it on your calendar and show up. Yes, Do not it's an appointment like, with yourself. Yeah. I mean, you seriously, you wouldn't go in front of a class and go, just a second, I posted something on Twitter and I want to see if I got any likes. Would you do that? Do you do it when you sit down to write? <laughs> I see a lot of smiles. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know I'm guilty, so I have to like make the date with myself. So, you know, all the things to do, like turn off your email so you don't even get the alert, because even if you can focus or even if you are you know, like disciplined and you're not clicking the alert, you still notice it and that disrupts your focus. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I want to make the point on this slide that reading is writing because you need in order to come up with ideas and get that creativity, you need to have input. And I think Peg told me this, but like the best definition for creativity I've seen is putting known things together in new ways. And you need those inputs to be able to do that. So then you're going to get it all uploaded, reread the proposal guidelines just to make sure you've got everything. Uh, once it's uploaded, look at the proposal image because a friend of mine had every single one of her betas show up in the PDF as a box. So the PDF conversion screwed up. So make sure you have time to fix those sorts of problems, right? Um, do no trust the spell checker because <laughs> that'll go right through the spell checker. Mm -hmm. All right, does anybody actually do this? No, it usually looks like this. Um, for me, it's not references, it's figures that I curse the most about. Figures, pen. Yeah. I can't put those in word in front of my children because they learn new words. Yeah. All right, so we will stay on for office hours um, for 15 minutes. So anybody who's got questions that you want to ask us, otherwise we'll see you in a month. So do a lot of thinking. You're welcome. And um, we can, should we stop recording? Yeah, stop okay. recording.